Hello everybody, my name is Hannah Cleaney and today we are going to be reading William Still and his Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad, written by Don Tate. This book holds a, a bit of extra significance in that it won the elementary level award of the Carter G. Woodson Book Awards. And that award is specifically aimed at educating the youth about the experiences of minorities in America. And Don Tate just does a really great job at um, highlighting the experiences that African Americans face during this dark time period in America in a way that's appropriate for children. It's it's honest and it's informative and it's inspiring. So I'm now going to read the book aloud and stay tuned for a discussion about the themes of the story and the narrative choices the author makes that makes the book so powerful. So here we go. <laughs> William Still in his Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad. This story begins at a time when the United States was split in two. In the North, Black people were free, and in the South, they were enslaved by whites. Slavery was a nightmare, Backbreaking work until the scorching sun, threats of lashing, or worse, no pay. Children were separated from their mamas and papas, brothers and sisters, sold away at auction, never to be seen again. Sometime during the 1700s, Levin and Sidney Steele were held captive on a Maryland farm, forced to work. Their four children were too, and their family yearned to live free. I will die before I submit to the yoke, Levin told the man who enslaved him. The two came to an agreement. Levin was allowed to work over hours, actually receiving a small income. With the money he earned, Levin purchased his freedom. But freedom wasn't always fair, especially to black people. Could a free black man remain in the South? Levin must have wondered. Might he be enslaved again? No chance in that. Levin bid his family goodbye with a plan to return to rescue them later. In a blink, he bolted north. Sydney wasn't so fortunate. There was no opportunity for her or the children to purchase their freedom. They were, remained behind, still enslaved, a separation Sydney could not endure. Torn and tormented, she whispered a parting, a parting prayer for her two boys, who were big and strong enough to fend for themselves. Then she escaped with her two girls. Sydney reunited with her husband in the Pine Woods near Washington's Township, New Jersey. They were together, free as the wind, and they changed their last name from Steel to Still to throw slave catchers off. Their new life was good, but living ached like an open sore. Levin and Sydney longed for their two sons they had left behind. And over the years, the family grew. Now there were 15 children, 15 mouths to feed. Oh, how they struggled. Money was tight and food was scarce. Shoes, if any, were hand-me-down. In 1821, the youngest child was born. Sunlit eyes, mahogany skin, they named him William. He grew quick as a weed. Eight years later, a neighbor was attacked late one night. The man had once been enslaved in the South. He had escaped and found peace in the pines. Slave catchers tracked the man down. They rushed at him, cuffed his arms, beat him badly. Thankfully, the man escaped again, but he needed help, and soon. The greedy men were still on the prowl. The neighbors called on William. The young boy knew every nook and cranny of the woods. William led the man to safety, some 20 miles away. The experience defined the rest of his life. William's father ruled the roost. His rules, choice were the priority, and education was not. 
Schooling had to wait for rainy days when the ground was too soggy for work. William looked forward to sharpening his mind, but attending class was no easy walk in the woods. The North might have been free, but free was not always fair, especially to Black people. One day, on the walk home after school, white kids pushed William over the side of a bridge. They laughed. William plunged into the water. Eventually, William's father pulled him out of school. Learning to read would have to wait a few seasons. Three winters later, conditions had improved. William returned to class when he was 17. He was there by sunrise, home by dusk. He studied spelling, defined words, practiced enunciation, learned math. Before long, he knew how to write too. One wintry evening, warmed by a fire, William grasped his favorite newspaper, The Colored American, an anti-slavery newspaper. It was owned and published by black people. They published stories that protested discrimination against black people in the North. They printed stories that encouraged emancipation of slaves in the South. The newspaper made William recall his parents' stories, stories about slavery, stories about escape, stories about his older brother left behind to suffer in bondage. William shouldered those stories into the next chapter of his life. By age 23, William craved more excitement, as any young man would. Life in the Pines moved at a snail's pace. Might the big city bring bigger opportunities? In 1844, he decided to find out. With $3 in his pocket and a billion dollars in pride, William planted himself north of the Delaware River in East Philadelphia. First things first, he needed a job and a roof over his head, and neither came readily. For three long years, William bounced from low paying job to low paying job. He threshed clamshells, hauled wood, laid bricks. He peddled oysters, dug wells, hawks clothes. He worked on a dock and then at a hotel, barely earning the smell of money. Long cold winters, grumbling belly, no decent place to lay his head. Not as glamorous as a life he had imagined. But then a new opportunity arose. The Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society needed an office clerk and the pay was disappointingly low. But the job might lead William straight to the most prominent anti-slavery organizers in the area. With a foot in the door, maybe he could help enslaved people escape from the South. Reluctantly, he accepted the job. I go for liberty and improvement, William wrote in a letter to his new employers. In his new job, William sorted mail, emptied trash, swept off his floors until his arms ached. Not quite what he had hoped. William's employers were doing the work he hoped to do. They were abolitionists who spoke loudly against slavery. They sponsored meetings, signed petitions, published newspapers, and William worked hard beyond his office duties. He earned his employers trust, gained their respect, their loyalty, he climbed higher and higher until one day he became the manager. At that time, freedom seeking people were drawn to Philadelphia like a magnet. It was the nearest free city to slay to the slave holding South. They arrived daily by the dozens passengers on a secret network called the Underground Railroad. Freedom seeking men and women, young and old and in between, running, hiding, praying. They traveled from house to church, river to swamp, stop to stop to stop. It was a dangerous top secret journey from slavery to freedom. The passengers who arrived in Philadelphia were tired. They were sick and hungry, cut up, broken, marred and maimed, frantic, fearful, and fed up, but hopeful. William sought these travelers out and welcomed them into his house, which was now a station on the Underground Railroad.
One evening, an unexpected passenger arrived at his house. The man was middle-aged, stooped back, furrowed browed, threadbare clothes, and his name was Peter. He was looking for his mother, his family. Peter recounted his story. William listened in awe. Turned out, Peter had been enslaved in the South for more than 40 years. He'd gotten away and now he wanted to find his family who had escaped before him. Peter recalled the name of his parents, Levin and Sidney. He named one of his brothers, Levin. William was thunderstruck. Could this man be his Peter? His long lost but never forgotten older brother? Yes, he was. But Peter was confused by William's news. Was this some kind of trick to capture and return him to the South? He needed some convincing. From a mother who looked just like him. Peter's story was sad, tragic, miraculous, and extraordinary. And Peter's story restored his family. Could other people's stories reunite other families torn apart by slavery? Read that is again. From that point forward, William recorded every detail about each freedom seeker who passed through his office or home. He recorded their names, ages, boy or girl, man or woman, the hue of their skin, copper, chestnut, dark brown. Who had enslaved them? Where did they come from? Where were they going? It wasn't his job to do so, but William thought these written records might help someday, and William's hard work didn't go unnoticed. He climbed higher and higher at the Anti-Slavery Society, becoming the leader of a committee assigned to help freedom-seeking people. William corresponded with other agents on the Underground Railroad. He conducted interviews, counted money. He planned the rescues of freedom-seeking people, but his work didn't stop there. William also recorded the stories of people seeking freedom on his line of the Underground Railroad. In many ways, this was his most important work. William and Ellen Craft, a married couple, escaped slavery in Georgia traveling on first-class trains. They stayed in the best hotels and dined with a steamboat captain, all in disguise. Fair-skinned Ellen passed as a white man, and her husband pretended to be her slave. A man enslaved in Virginia climbed into a wooden crate and had shipped himself 28 hours to freedom, earning the name Henry Box Brown. And on several nights, freedom-seeking people passed through William's line on the, of the Underground Railroad Network, led by Harriet Moses Tubman herself, who had gone into the belly of the South to rescue them. William's committee provided them with money and replaced their worn shoes. William's work grew two, three, four times as long. His records helped reunite families torn apart by slavery to find each other once they'd been found freedom. But when enslaved people escaped, their Southern enslavers lost money and they demanded new laws. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was enacted. It required the return of runaways who had been captured, even if they had found their way to freedom. People living in free states where slavery was outlawed were forced to cooperate with the law or be brutally punished. The Fugitive Slave Act resulted in the kidnapping of free black people by greedy slave catchers and federal agents. No black person, free or not, north or south, was safe. William's work now put him in great danger. His records were evidence of crimes committed. William had a plan. He bundled his records, all those stories, and placed them where no one would think to look. In the back of a cemetery, inside a dark vault, among the rats and the dead. The laws were meant to shut down the Underground Railroad, but shut it down they did not. 
In Pennsylvania and New York, Michigan and Vermont, black people, black neighborhoods, black churches drove the Underground Railroad full stream north, carrying freedom, freedom seeking people straight on into Canada, known as Freedom's Land, where they would be safe. William's work at the Anti-Slavery Society was outstanding, but after 14 long years, he barely made any more money than he had on the day that he started. Helping freedom seekers was his passion, but passion didn't put, put food on the table for growing family. It was time for a change. William resigned from his job at the Anti-Slavery Society and he started a coal business. In 1860, the United States was bitterly divided over the issue of slavery. War broke out and many died. In 1861, a new president was elected. Could Abraham Lincoln reunite the country? Would he choose freedom or slavery? In time, Lincoln did the right thing. He chose freedom. William's coal business thrived in the shadow of the Civil, Civil War. By the 1870s, he was one of the richest black men of his time. But even now, life was still not always fair, especially to black people. William used his power and influence to help. Black children have been excluded from the YMCA, so William helped start a branch for them. Black people had been forbidden from riding Philadelphia city street cards, so William protested and won. In 1872, he published his book, The Underground Railroad, a collection of stories of hardships and hair breadth escapes. William Stills' records and the stories he preserved reunited families torn apart by slavery. Because that's what stories can do. Protest and justice, soothe, teach, inspire, connect. Stories save lives. William's stories needed to be talked about and so did slavery's nightmare so that it will never happen again. And that is William Still and his freedom stories. This book I believe is incredibly important and powerful for children to read or to have it read to them, not only in the powerful themes that his story brings forth in dealing with resilience and hope and perseverance and selflessness and altruism. All of these themes I think are such important lessons for kids to learn while at the same time, the book holds a lot of educational value, as I was saying, in that it is extremely informative. And I think that the the third person narrative really helps get this get these ideas across in that it is able to focus on not only his story, but also the surrounding world and environment and society at the time. For instance, I think that it's really cool that the author gave a little bit of background as to what exactly the Underground Railroad was in tying his story in with how he his house ended up being a station. I think that the Underground Railroad is something that's so complex and like deeply disturbing. So when introducing it to kids, you have to be you have to be careful in um, not scaring them to no ends, but also it's important for children to know our history. And I think that the author with his like shorter description of the Underground Railroad, for instance, right here, um, freedom seeking men and women, young and old and in between running, hiding, praying. They traveled from house to church, river to swamp, stop to stop to stop. It was a dangerous top secret journey from slavery to freedom. And I think that that is just like the perfect way to describe it to someone who is firstly being introduced to it in a way that isn't um, horribly disturbing and graphic. I also want to point out here that I think that the way that Dante illustrated the book is very 
it almost provides a sort of balance between the content that is being addressed and also understanding his audience that this book is made for children. So the illustrations are, while honest and, and real, they also convey warmth to help counteract how intense the material actually is. So for example, when, when um, Sydney Steele was being reunited with her long lost son, we have just a joyous reunion and with warm colors, smiling faces. And you see, you just see a lot of humanity, I feel like, in the illustrations, but not in a way that's too much for children to understand, but in a way that's like, oh, these are people, these are people who have feelings, who experience love for their family, who have to actually go through these things. And I think that coupling the words with such powerful illustrations was just a really wise choice on Tate's end. I also want to point out that I think it's really cool that um, we get to see William Stills just whole life story portrayed in this book, which helps further develop the themes in understanding his personality and who he was. Um, like for instance, starting as a young boy growing up on that farm, he is shown leading a man to freedom because he was so good with knowing the ins and outs of the forest. And it just displays how at such a young age he, he wanted to help people and furthermore persevere in light of the obstacles that he was being faced. Especially I think that like the points of him having such a strong and deep desire to learn and wanting to continue to go to school even after being mistreated by the white kids who were there as well is incredibly important for children to see and understanding and understanding the true value of the education that they receive and the lack of obstacles that they might face compared to the obstacles faced here. And I also think it's it's so incredibly important for children, especially of who come from minority communities and backgrounds, to see heroes such as William Still being portrayed in children's literature that they're coming across and seeing people who may look like them being honored for standing up and facing an issue that that was just so impossible and so hard to imagine and it's, it's hard to believe that it happened in this way but we can't hide from our history and expanding on that a little bit uh the reason means to why it's so important is even touched on upon by dante at the like very last line of the book which states that william's stories needed to be told so slavery's nightmare will never happen again and i think that that's another really important thing to teach along with history and talking about dark things from our past because a lot of the times kids or people in general can look at it and be like i don't need to learn about that that's not relevant but he spells it out word for word and through him spelling it out word for word we're able to look at the world around us and understand that hey there are maybe things that aren't going right and problems that society faces and it's so important for kids to realize that with perseverance and with intention there can be changes made and I think that that's one of the most important parts of the Carter G. Woodson book awards and this story in general and honestly with children's literature in general with what we teach children is so important because and this is like the most cliche thing ever but children are our future and we learn through stories. Stories are so incredibly helpful in helping us to realize that we can write our own stories. We can choose, make decisions and we can make changes. And through the more content that children are exposed to that exhibit those lessons, the, the better chances we have as at improving as a society. And I don't think that that's something that should be ignored or disregarded or not but i think it's just very important to award and recognize these books um and ultimately i think that this book holds a lot of power just in 
showing children that normal, everyday, ordinary people can make extraordinary, huge, impactful changes just with, from one little decision. And that is shown so well through the different themes that have been developed in this book. And I hope that you guys can take what I have spoken about today and really think about it, meditate on it, and you just got to keep producing good stuff to throw into children's minds so that they can understand their power. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don Tate. Thank you, Don Tate, for this great book. And I hope you all have a beautiful day.